The turn of the 20th century was a time of historic abundance. World War I, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression. With such an abundance of historical context, there's bound to be gaps unfilled within our textbooks. One of these historical nobodies was not just a person, but an entire pandemic. The Influenza of 1918. The disease was nicknamed the Spanish Flu, due to Spaniards showing the first symptoms. However, its origins can only be contained to somewhere in Europe. Wherever it started, it first came to America through Boston Harbor. How it was transmitted in Boston was a mystery to the people. An elderly woman reported seeing green fog roll into the harbor. Colonel Philip S. DeWan stated German spies spread the pathogen in the movie theaters. In reality, it was the sailors coming back from the war. What these accounts show is how little the people understood virology. Now, the germ theory of disease had been developed, which stated that pathogens are spread through microscopic organisms. In fact, a doctor by the name of Richard Frederick Johannes Pfeiffer discovered a bacteria which he credited with the root of almost all disease. So when the pandemic of 1918 first hit, the people believed it was a disease they had known before. And when the pathogen truly took hold, it was too late. And the doctors had to play catch up with a disease that had a three month lead. Well, bacteria are treated with an antibiotics. Viruses are not killed by antibiotics. So in 1918, I don't believe they had a penicillin yet, but let's imagine they did. And they had a patient that had a bacterial infection. Well, that bacterial infection is gonna present itself much like a viral infection would. So the physicians at the time just used what they thought was gonna be effective, something that was going to treat a bacterial infection, and obviously that's not going to work against a viral infection. Once the disease had taken its grip, the full repercussions of the doctor's mistakes were witnessed by society. With the flu came fever, nausea, diarrhea, and other typical flu symptoms. What set this infection apart from others, however, were the mahogany spots and blue lips that it gave its victims. These physical features were a result of the lungs filling up with fluid and would ultimately result in suffocation of the patient. Well, when, when an individual is exposed to a pathogen, the body recognizes it's a, it's a pathogen because there are antigens on that organism. So the antigen simply tell, tells your body that that is a non-self cell. And your body then recognizes it and it goes through a process to develop antibodies that can kill that pathogen. This is a, a process that takes a little bit of time so if you had a newly formed pathogen, especially if it was a pathogen that caused symptoms and disease quickly, the body wouldn't even recognize it and wouldn't have the ability to fight it off as quickly. It was in 1918 that Richard Edwin Shope had to decide what his future career would be. He grew up as a farm boy and received an average education. And when the flu pandemic hit, he was compelled to enter the virology field and would go on to shape what we view now as the flu vaccine. Richard Edwin Shope chose to pursue in the field of virology because of catastrophes like Fort Devens. One of the first locations that the flu hit, Fort Devens quickly became overrun with the disease. James Howard Park Jr., one of the doctors on the site, said that he would literally watch men drop dead as they walked across camp. One of his patients, Private Vaughan, died and could be seen with holes in his lungs, ranging from the size of a pin to a dime. Another compelling reason for Shope to enter the virology field is the world that was being shaped around him. The flu affected hundreds of thousands at a time and hit major cities like Philadelphia hard. Philadelphia installed new legislature and continuous public service announcements in an attempt to contain the pandemic. All public services were closed, including school, libraries, amusement parks, entertainment, etc. Seattle was also hit hard, where fines and penalties were upheld for not taking the precautions mandated by the city. Seattle handed out masks and required them in any public center. If those two cities weren't enough to convince Richard Shope Perhaps the pure aggressiveness of the influenza was, 
This pandemic resulted in 28% of the U.S. population being diagnosed and 675,000 Americans losing their lives. The American life expectancy dropped from 51 years old to 39 in 1918 due to the disease hitting middle-aged and younger citizens. If these statistics weren't enough to convince Edward Shope, then perhaps the fact that the disease killed more people than the Great War was. Wiping out 40% of the Navy and an estimated 36 of the Army were diagnosed with influenza. Yes, the flu of 1918 was one of Mother Nature's most efficient killers. Richard Shope earned his degree in virology in 1924, but it wouldn't be until 1928 that he finally broke through. Shope identified that it wasn't only a virus which was causing the devastating effects, but it also used a bacterium that previously had made scientists think that it was a bacterial disease. Shope was able to do this through his experience as a farmhand and his operation with pigs, which would later be found as one of the reasons that the influenza could spread so rapidly. He would inject the healthy pigs with a combination of the influenza and bacterium, while previous scientists had only chosen to do one or the other. Death would follow shortly after injection. Richard Edwin Shope broke the mystery of the 1918 pandemic. His discovery would lead to the vaccination of flu in the ways which we know them today. While Richard Shope doesn't find his way into many textbooks, he accelerated the timeline of flu vaccinations and ultimately saved thousands of lives from then to present day. So I think there's a lot of things that we can take away from the swine flu of 1918. First, uh, the mobile, you know, extremely mobile population. Back then, it was the end of World War I in which everyone went home. Now, we have people that are flying between countries and we have an extremely mobile population. This would enable a pathogen to spread extremely quickly. Two, back then, it overwhelmed the healthcare ability to treat all these patients. Here in the U.S., hmm, we have about 300 physicians for every 100,000 patients or population. Third world countries only have two. Uh, so I think you could easily overwhelm third world countries' healthcare ability. And even here in the U.S., if we had a, a major outbreak, you would see our healthcare system probably buckle. Uh, three, you, we, could, we could have a pathogen that is so new to us that we just simply don't know how to treat it and kill it off. And therefore, patients would run the full course of their disease state while we developed something to kill these new pathogens, much like, you know, this influenza virus of 1918. I think that we as a class like to believe that history is controlled by actions. Whether it's messing up and facing the consequences like the Federal Reserve and the Great Depression, or taking a risk and reaping the rewards like the Battle of Midway. However, this isn't always the case. Sometimes the largest parts of history are dictated by things outside of a civilization's control. Disease, which can prevent a regiment from advancing like the influenza of 1918 did to a British regiment, or a potato famine resulting in a mass migration of Irish immigrants to America to a modern day hurricane destroying the homes and lives of thousands. We like to believe that the past has been shaped by man so that we can then have faith that we can shape the future. But what if it's not that simple? What if the essence which truly shaped mankind is the unavoidable, unpredictable hand of mother nature? And if that is the case, how do we prepare for her next move?